This is the 20th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guide Batteries, Pro, Gamakatsu, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning, and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk about fishing March 12th, which means we're like just a couple days over a week away from the Bassmaster Classic on Grand Lake of the Cherokees. Uh, Have I been in Oklahoma long enough, Gene, to call you a fellow Oklahoman, or am I still a transplant? We're talking 2005 here. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's plenty long enough. Plenty long enough. All right, fellow Oklahoman, Bass Fishing Hall of Fame inductee 2021 or 22? (laughs) One, two, yeah, two. 2022 Bass Fishing Hall of Fame inductee Gene Gillen and current uh, conservation director for BASS, and also something that I just learned. You came early because you have your stuff together and you like to get early and get things settled, unlike uh, unlike me. But you are also on the tech committee for Bassmaster. Correct. So we're going to dive into that a little bit and then talk about all sorts of fun things that are probably the most important aspect of the sport that no one likes to talk about because it's not sexy. Is that a fair assessment? Oh, more than fair, yeah. <laughs> You're you're the one who told me that one time. You said the biggest, (laughs) the hardest thing is to get people involved in conservation and that type, because unless it directly impacts you and the fishery that you fish, it's very hard to get people to be passionate about it because it's an out of sight, out of mind thing. That's very true. It's, uh, yeah, it, fishermen tend to be reactive rather than proactive. And until something bad happens, it's hard to get fishermen to, to get involved. And, and so a lot of times, uh, conservation issues just don't get the, don't see the light of day. Scott Martin, uh, I was talking with at the open and, you know, he's done posts about, uh, what's going on down in Florida with Mm -hmm. the Lake Okeechobee and the two groups as far as do you send water is it like do you send water out into the gulf which causes that and then they're claiming it's sugar anyway so scott posts this stuff very passionately off air behind the scenes he is twice as passionate about it like i i just mentioned it to him and he went into it you know what really grinds my gear speech for a solid half hour after one of the days of practice (laughs) and especially when it comes to conservation i didn't realize how much i guess i did but you know he was explaining it how much politics plays behind the scenes especially with water and when you think about it i mean this goes back to kind of the beginning of time when people started settling because water is like and who has the water is i mean that's like wars and battles have been fought over water rights sure sure water is uh the a lot of the issues that we have in in fishing relate to who owns the water, who's got the the control of the water, and unfortunately, a lot of times fishing interests aren't at the top priority level, and that's you know those of us that are passionate about about bass fishing have a very narrow focus a lot of times. Uh, when there's so many other pieces of that puzzle, so many other people, organizations, governments involved in in water rights and who uses it and where it goes mm-hmm. and that sort of thing, uh, it's it's not a simple fix, and that's part of the problem. Is that we want we want instant gratification. We want something fixed today. To we want it done the the way it benefits us, mm-hmm. but unfortunately there's a lot of other players and politics and money play a big big role in it unfortunately you mentioned fishing in the priority level in your are you 35 years into this now 
Oh, uh, more like 40. 40? Yeah. Okay. Oh, list the priority level from one to one to fishing. As a whole, I know it's a little bit different just based on specific situations, yeah. but you've dealt with stuff not only in, in Oklahoma with the DNR here, but also on a national level. You've been to Washington. You've done all that. You've dealt yeah. with a lot of it. Like where, where just kind of rank the priority level. I'm curious. Well, water water rights, if you want to okay. call it, if we want to you know, kind of go down a list, obviously people water supply for human consumption and human needs is typically the most important thing. Um, a lot of the, the water supplies then around the country also serve other purposes like flood control. Uh, some of them are for navigation uh, and there's irrigation and, and uh, agricultural uses. Recreation which would include fishing. Okay. Typically are below those other ones. Yeah. There's there's next to very few few places around the country where recreation is say in the top 3 uh uses for a body of water. Um but it it's uh, unfortunately from the fishing standpoint some of the things that have to be done for those higher priorities are counterproductive to the things we would like to see for the fishing. You know, if, if uh, navigation or water supply changes water levels, fluctuation stuff, sometimes those things that, that are mandated to be done for those higher priorities can be detrimental to the quality of the fishing mm -hmm. and the from the fishing interest standpoint from our standpoint whether it's Bassmaster or whether it's a state fish and wildlife agency sometimes they just don't have the control and i used to always say as, as a biologist we've got to play the cards we're dealt and sometimes we just don't have a very good hand so you just make the best of uh I'm trying to think. So like what a place like where fishing would be important, I would think would have to have a high population of people that the only reason they're there is for recreational fishing that expands beyond the fishery for a lot of livelihoods, a high population of guy like guiding to mm -hmm. where people are only in that region for fishing. And there's people whose livelihoods depend on it. Is, would, would Mille Lacs or something be like a fishery where the, where there's a lot of emphasis. I know that there's yeah. a lot of, noise around Mille Lacs between the smallmouth and the walleye and we've talked about uh you've mentioned there's like the smallmouth alliance up there and mm -hmm. all sorts would would that be a, an example of a fishery that is driven and decisions are made around the fishing and not the other factors that are typically more important on other bodies of water yes okay. yes that that would be a good example because there's not the they don't draw out of it for irrigation it's not flood control. It's, it might be water supply for a mm -hmm. very small, you know, some of the little communities around there. But there's another big player in some of the, especially some of the northern lakes uh, and in the Pacific Northwest places like that, where tribal interests, the Indian tribes, have a huge role in what happens in how that lake is managed. So it, it's not just the recreational anglers that that have the voice the the management of the fishery has has got to take in not just the the walleye fishermen and the bass fishermen but they have the tribal interests mm -hmm. that have by treaty rights to be able to take fish out of those lakes so so those that's another one of those juggling acts that the dnr in minnesota in particular has to has to deal with or like in the case of leech lake harvest rice correct which for those of you oh, if you're listening to btl you follow the open eqs let's just let's just face it it's kind of, there, i don't think there's very many people who listen to btl and that don't follow the tournament trails but uh wild rice you i had never heard of it until yeah. leech lake was on the schedule and when do we go there we go there i've got my schedule up there we go to uh leech in august yeah huh. We'll be there for my birthday. The middle of August, 
everyone in the country is going to learn a lot about wild rice. Let's right. just leave it at that. Yeah. It's a different, it's one of those little subtle little things that there's certain places where certain aspects really play a role. Uh, you know, I'll give you another example, Lake Fork, where we just had the, yeah. the elite tournament. Lake Fork was built as a water supply for the Dallas metro area. Oh, I did not realize that. Lake Fork was not built for fishing. Are you serious? Lake Fork was built as the Sabine River Authority for flood control and water supply. Now, as it turns out, the city of Dallas or, or the, the Dallas metro area has not had to use much of that water for a long, long time. So the lake stayed relatively stable grew a lot of vegetation, grew a lot of big bass, developed this huge economy around it based on bass fishing and crappie fishing. And it hasn't been until just the last, oh, probably less than 10 years, where there's been much in the way of water withdrawals that would affect the, the fluctuation of the lake and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So even though the lake wasn't built for fishing, it, uh, the Texas Parks and Wildlife did an economic study down there several years ago, and it was worth like $30 million a year to the local economy. And I'm sure it's even more than that down just because of inflation and everything. But um, when you start talking about some of these other lakes where you think about fishing, uh, <clears throat> Lake Texoma, here one in, in our backyard, uh, economic study showed that the the economic impact from the striper fishing on Lake Texoma was worth like $25 million a year because lots and lots of guides, thousands of people a year come there fishing. But when you compare that to the value of the water being sold out of that lake to the North Texas Municipal Water District, the fishing doesn't even come close to what the water is worth. So Lake Texoma is the main water source for the majority of North Texas. Part, part of there's a, there's a, an organization, a, a group of municipalities in kind of the Northern suburbs of the Dallas Metro area Okay, that get a lot of their water. Uh, they've got a number of reservoirs around and, and Texoma is just, there's a okay. pipe, a pipeline. But, but what I'm getting at is that the value of that water is worth way more. Um, you look at some of the lakes in, in Arizona, they pump that water to Southern California, like Pleasant Roosevelt. Well, and Mead. yeah. And that, well, it, like Mead waters for, for Las Vegas, yeah. you know, the, the okay. value of the fishery in those lakes is far less than what the water's worth for, you know, human consumption. Mm -hmm. And so, the priority levels for managing that lake for fishing are way down the list. Which is understandable. Yeah. So, unfortunately, the, the anglers always say, well, gosh, the Corps of Engineers always drops the water level right during the spawn, or they raise the water level. They come up with, you know, there's always mm -hmm. somebody that that's doing something wrong when it comes to the fish management, but you take what the Corps of Engineers or TVA, for example, what they do with those water levels is mandated by Congress. And fishing and recreation are far enough down on the priority list that, you know, the Corps says, okay, the law says we have to have a water level here at this time of year and here at this time of year. And if that impacts the fishery, well, that's the way it is. All right, that brings up, this is a dumb question, and there's probably people are going to roll their eyes on this, but like Tennessee fisheries do it a lot, like the TVA fisheries, you mentioned it. So like a Douglas, yep. where you go there in the winter and all the docks are dry. 40 and foot drawdown. What is the purpose of like a drawdown? Okay. And why do they bring it back up? Like I, I get it, like I understand what it does, yeah. but I don't understand why they do it. Well, the TVA system originally was built for hydropower and for navigation. And so that's the top priority is, is trying to maintain the, the right amount of water in the main stem reservoirs 
for hydropower and for Which navigation. Are, what are the main stem reservoirs? Well, that on the would be TV? that would be Kentucky Lake, uh, Pickwick, Gunnersville, all the way up to to Knoxville. So all the other smaller lakes. That the little are on the little chains. lakes on the outside, the Douglas and the Cherokees, and you know all of those lakes are now were built basically to regulate how much water is going into the big river. So in the wintertime, they draw them way down so that when the spring rains hit, they have the capacity to hold that water back to keep. So you don't flood the big river. And, and that helps maintain the, the proper amount of flow in the main river for navigation for hydropower. So once, once the big rains that, you know, typically we get our big rains in the spring and early summer, yeah. once those have gone through, they, they can raise those water levels back up. And a lot of those smaller lakes actually have hydropower facilities on mm -hmm. them too. But that those big drawdowns are basically a, a safety net to hold back water. Same thing on in here in Oklahoma, the Arkansas navigation system, mm -hmm. um, a lot Fort of the Gibson. lakes, that's why Fort Gibson fluctuates so drastically. You could go up three foot in a day. Right. Oh, yeah. 20 feet overnight. Yeah. I fished a tournament over there one year where it came up overnight, 20 feet. Okay, so it's the same thing with the same GRDA. Thing. The, 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 the Arkansas River Navigation System for the barge traffic, they want to maintain a pretty level flow, so they use these tributary reservoirs to help regulate that. So in order to have barge traffic to get millions of dollars of goods, coal, whatever they're getting down there, they're saying, hey, we're willing to, to flood Fort Gibson or with the other levels because it's more valuable for us to have commerce going up and down this river. And if all of this was to dump into the river, there'd be no way that we could. Yeah, they couldn't regulate it. Regulate it. it. Yeah, you'd, you'd wind up with flood. And, and that's just a dollar and cents thing. <clears throat> that's that's what it amounts to. So what about. I remember a couple of years ago, there were a bunch of pissed off people in Grove when Grand flooded. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, why don't you guys drop the water level? And they didn't drop the water level and it got up into the houses. Was that kind of the same deal where they were having to make decisions? Yeah. Based? Where did they want that water to go? Well, from Grand, it goes down into to Hudson and yeah. then Fort Gibson and eventually and into the Arkansas River. So it's River. the same thing. It was just a, right. a, a chain of events because if you put it into that, then it would flood right. that and then that and then that. When, and it would... when you think about something like the TVA system or or the Grand River system here in Oklahoma or the Columbia River out in the, the Northwest, yeah. it's a network of a bunch of lakes connected. And then there's these tributary lakes off to the sides and the Corps of Engineers or whoever the, the managers are can't manage one lake at a time. They've got to look at the whole network. It's a chain and reaction. So when you get tremendous amounts of rain over an entire watershed, they've got to regulate the whole system. And if the river's flooding, there's nowhere to dump the water. Yeah. And so Fort Gibson fills up. Fort Gibson fills up. There's only so much it can hold. Now we got to back up. Hudson can only hold so much. Now we've got to hold more in Grand Lake. And so the water levels come up. And a lot of that's just because of the nature of the, the beast, so to speak, that um, they've got to manage it as a whole system, not just one lake at a time. I feel like that was a fair question after that explanation. Uh, so what about, you hear a lot also out on the Cal Delta, a lot of stuff going on. So it, are the deltas regulated like that too or what are the how, how does how does bit. that work because i know what i don't even know what's going I'm, I'm not as familiar with it out there but i know there's all sorts of issues going on on the delta well is that fair am i, am I yeah, right on that no it's no it's it's there's a lot of the water in the cal delta is is promised to agriculture okay because and it's the valuable because billions the, of the, dollars. the central valley in california is produces most of the food we eat in this country or a lot of it anyway and so uh, that and the fact that the population in in especially in southern california is you know continually growing mm -hmm. so there's this huge demand for water and so again it's part of that whole network you've got these reservoirs up in the mountains that 
have to hold water at certain times, release water at certain times, uh, filling water up into the Delta and then water from the Delta is pumped and piped, you know, into the agricultural fields all across California. And that's huge, huge, huge amounts of money that are controlling the politics there. And from a fishery standpoint, that makes it much, way, way down on the way list. down on the list. And, and the fish managers in California, they, you know, uh, again, that, that water's not just there for fishing. So they have to, they have to play with the cards they're dealt. And in some cases, it's not a very good deal for them. You're talking about money. I would assume that's the main reason why n- name a, name a, predominantly healthy grass lake that has a lot of really nice houses on it. Like million dollar houses. uh, Well, isn't that the reason because of the money? And if you're, if you haven't, you don't want the grass and you want to ski and be able to get into your dock and not have the hydrilla beds and things like they have a big influence on that, on what gets sprayed, what gets killed. No, am sometimes, I wrong on that? Because I think just as an angler, we assume it's like a couple rich guys going, I want my kids to be able to jump off the dock sometimes, and not be covered in salad. Sometimes, I mean, you think about it, there's some there's some pretty big houses on Gunnersville, and TVA doesn't doesn't do a lot of spraying on Gunnersville. It's but, been an issue on Gunnersville in the I past, know, I know. It, it has been, and they've created some groups that try to help manage that more effectively. See, everyone on here saying, yeah, big money houses kill all the grass. Bingo, Matt. Yeah. But so that's. But you got to remember that from the from the agency, st- whoever's managing that water, mm-hmm. there's a lot of stakeholders there. Um, I'll give you a perfect example: Lake Apopka, yep, in Florida. About I don't know, sometime this last several months ago, it is managed by the St. John's Water Management District. And they supply water to lots and lots of people. They had a public meeting to talk about hydrilla control on Lake Apopka. Now, why? let me finish. (laughs) Lake Apopka is, uh, was at one time, one of the most polluted lakes in the entire country. They got a lot of things cleaned up. Hydrilla started coming in. The fishery has been really good the past several years. In fact, a lot of the tournaments, that's where on the Harris chain, people are running to a pop good because that's where the, you know, a lot of good fishing is. Yeah. The weed control people in Florida don't like hydrilla because it tends to get out of control fairly easily. If you leave too much, the next thing you know, you've got way too much and then it hinders all sorts of things. So they decided they were going to have some public meetings to talk about the, the management process. Three fishermen showed up. That's it. Nobody showed up to voice their concerns. And when, when you've got homeowners and, and this goes back to what some of your viewers are saying, when you've got homeowners that live on lakes. Gene, there's three docks on Lake Apopka. Yeah, but there's a lot of other people that use the lake. We're not the only people that use the lake. But what I'm saying is the fishermen didn't show up to voice their concerns. When you've got lakes that have homeowners associations that are very vocal and very powerful, it's not necessarily that they got m- the most money. It's because they show up at meetings and they make their wishes and, and the fishermen typically sit on the sidelines and wonder why the bus just ran them over. And, and that's one of the problems we've got in so many places around the country where, yes, the fishing may not be a top priority, but even though we're a lower priority, we just don't get people mobilized a lot of times to be able to fight the fight. Or in the case of some of these lakes, what, what we've always tried to do is say, let's at least get a seat at the table when these decisions are being made. And if you don't have a seat at the table, you're going to get run over. Mm-hmm. 
And, and that's, that's just the nature of the way politics works these days. And so in some cases, it's not just because some rich guy wants to get rid of the, the weeds. Um, in some places, herbicide treatments are mandated by the state legislature. There's states where they have said, I'll take North Carolina as an example. Okay. Most of the reservoirs in North Carolina are owned by power companies like Duke Energy. I did not know that. Duke Energy doesn't want floating mats of hydrilla floating into their intakes and clogging up the pumps on nuclear power plants. And they've got like trillions of dollars with a T. Yeah. So hydrilla is kind of like public enemy number one to them. Yeah. And so when the stuff starts to grow, they want to get rid of it because that directly influences not only the water quality, but the fact that they, they have issues with it in terms of power generation and that sort of thing. Okay, so it's not because some rich guy doesn't want hydrilla out in front of his dock. It's because the power company doesn't want it screwing up the power Wait, plant. Wait, did you say that the power company owns the lake? Yes. How does that work? They built the lakes. It's just like GR so, GRDA built Grand Lake. Okay. So even though it's a public, is it a public fishery still, though? How does that work? Yes. Yes. This is... I've they, never heard they of own, this. They own, it's, it's like uh, Kanawha Lake here in Oklahoma. Okay. Oklahoma Gas and Electric, yeah. OG&E, owns Kanawha Lake. It's public fishing water. They don't own the water. They own the bucket. Did they build the lake? Yes. So a power company came in. There was a parcel of yes. land. Yes. They went to the state and they said, hey, we want to build a lake here. We want to bring this many jobs. This is what we want to do. This we're is gonna, what we want to do. We're going to generate electricity. We're going to generate electricity. It's going to be this many billions of dollars. And the state goes, awesome. And then and a bunch of engineers go out and say. Right. And they, they build the lake. And then the state then, the state fish and wildlife agency is is tasked then with trying to, to regulate or manage. It, so the why fishery. don't they just build it in a circle? Like, why don't they just, why is it all weirdly shaped and stuff? Why don't they just, they build a dam across the river and you get whatever. So you, every you little, get. okay. Yeah. You would think, okay. Uh, Lake of the Ozarks. Oh, so they're looking for an area that already has water coming in with sure. the river coming in sure. that they can just dam up and then, then right. it fills up and right. then whatever happens happens. And then after all that, then, the fisheries right. comes and in it, and say, all right, we and, got this body of water. How right. can we turn this into a fishery? What do we want to stock in here? How can we make a little bit of money on the side with it? The fishing, that was dumb. the, the like recreational that. aspects are secondary. are secondary or even, even more than second, less than secondary. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. getting, I'm getting roasted. So, you know, Lake of the Ozarks was built as a, uh, a power generation. Yeah. You know, so there, there's lakes like that all over the country <clears throat> that were built by power companies. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of a lot of places were built by, say, the Corps of Engineers or you know, TVA, but there's quite a number of them around. Uh, oh, so that's the Coosa, the Coosa River chain in Alabama. So that's why there's a lot of underwater, like there's an underwater town on Grand, and there was a bunch of things when Lake Fork in 1980 that got moved used to be, it used to be a farmland used to be farmland but mm -hmm. because it was ideal for what they wanted to do is that like imminent domain or whatever where they're like hey like to <clears throat> yeah. you, you gotta move yeah. because this is where we're damning yeah, this they, thing they, up they pay off the, the landowners and move them out and but it's yeah, i do know about clinton like i mean i understand what a power plant lake is but i didn't uh, i just yeah. don't understand like how that there, works there's, the there's a lot it. of a lot of the larger lakes around were were built by the reservoirs anyway mm -hmm. were built by uh, were power companies are there new uh, is there a, there a new one in texas that i just heard about there's, being built it was like one of the first new lakes there's in the country. two new two new lakes being built in texas one of them is called bodark it's like the tree, B-O-I-S-D-A-R-C, Bodark. Uh, and the other one is Ralph Hall, H-A-L-L. -L. And they're both in northeast Texas near, uh, I guess Bonham is probably the nearest town. Bodark is, I think, almost full. I don't know when it's supposed to open. Ralph Hall is apparently still filling. It's, 
it's a ways. I think both of them are a little ways from being, you know, open to the public, but Texas parks and wildlife has been, uh, I, I know they've been stocking some of the ponds and that'll be filled up, covered up when, the, mm-hmm. when the lake fills and, uh, putting in habitat and stuff like that. So that when the lake fills up, you know, getting boat ramps built and all that kind of stuff. But those are both being built as water supplies for the the municipalities in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Oh, yeah. Here it is. There's like a whole <clears throat> website, uh, bodarklake.org. Here, yeah. I'll show it. It's very interesting. If you want to know, like, kind of how this stuff starts. And the reason that the reason that there haven't been any significantly big numbers of new reservoirs built in the last 20 years is it costs billions of dollars. It ain't cheap to build a lake like that of any size anyway. Now you might build a, you know, a thousand acre one, but you talk about building a, 15 or 20,000 acre reservoir, you're talking about huge amounts of money and a 20 year process on this lake. By the time that they started it with permits till the time that water delivery was scheduled to begin 20 years, 2003 to 2023. This is cool. Like on this boat arc, it has every little deal along it. Like Mm -hmm. 2003 planning and permitting, then June, 2015 water use permit, 18 army Corps of engineer, permit november 18 august 18 environmental mitigation there's there's a big key right there part of the reason that when when the the reservoir building boom back in the 60s and 70s there was not near as much environmental permitting and land was a lot cheaper now you want to build a big lake like that Mm mm-hmm you got to jump through a lot of environmental hoops and the price of land is skyrocketed so that just the cost of acquiring the places that are going to get flooded uh, are just astronomical. And so, but the reason they can do that is because the water is so valuable to be able to sell it to the consumers in this case in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So it's, uh, it's, it does boil down to who's got the biggest checkbook when you're talking about building reservoirs and stuff like that. And then once the lake fills up, then the state fish and wildlife agency gets, if it's, if it's going to be a public reservoir, then they get the opportunity to try to manage that fishery and try to make the fishing the best they can Mm -hmm. based on how that lake's going to operate, whether, you know, I'll give you, here's another example. When I was in college at Texas A&M was when Lake Fork was being built and they did a tremendous amount of pre impoundment work. They cleared places. They left a lot of trees. They, they poisoned out all of the ponds that were in the basin so that they knew there wasn't going to be any trash fish or anything in there that, that would grow up. They stocked a bunch of fish in those ponds. They did a lot of work ahead of time. So the lake fills up. Everything's great. Ray Roberts was going to be the next Lake Fork. They built Ray Roberts, did a lot of the same things, cleared some of it, left a lot of trees, stocked the ponds. The problem with Lake Fork, they and, and it was kind of predicted that it was going to be this way, Lake Fork is upstream from Louisville, Lake Louisville in Dallas. Louisville is Dallas's main water supply. So the priority for Ray Roberts is to deliver water downstream to Lake Louisville. So Ray Roberts goes up and down and up and down. The hydrilla, whatever kind of vegetation that tried to get established in Ray Roberts, it had a hard time. Um, the water never stayed as clear, Mm -hmm. you know, the lake just never developed the way, obviously from the fishing standpoint, we had hoped it would, but we kind of, the Corps of Engineers kind of predicted, Hey, you know, it's going to fluctuate. It's going to be different, you know? And so 
you may have these great intentions up front, but sometimes those other priorities, in this case, water supply, uh, is the trump card. And uh, the the it, it's still a good lake. Obviously, yeah, we're having the Bassmaster Classic there in 2025. Yeah. Um, but it it never turned into that world class fishery that Lake Fork has become. Uh, that that they had hoped to see out of out of that lake. Right, we are talking with Bass Fishing Hall of Fame member Gene Gillen, also uh, conservation director for Bass. <laughs> I only, I think I got out of there fairly unscathed. I only said one dumb thing. Uh, it was pretty dumb, though. Like, you know, nah. looking back on it, I wish I could take back the circle comment. Yeah, um, but we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Bass Fishing Hall of Fame scholarships, Bass Fishing Hall of Fame grants, and AFCO and Bass Conservation grants. And then we'll dive into the tech committee uh, because I got some questions about that. You're a member of the Bassmaster Tech Committee committee uh, okay. i don't know how much you can you can say about that or not but i'll ask all the questions and then it'll be up to you on what to say because <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't have to answer to it i just ask the question so it's btl on a tuesday gene gillen in studio would be back right after this the new puma sts has been redesigned from the ground up with the angler design function and performance in mind nothing on this new offering was compromised and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. All right, we're back. Uh, not good. Thought I had that problem fixed, Gene. <laughs> Technology is wonder wonderful thing. It is. All right, we got Sometimes. we 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 got through one uh, one commercial, so uh, we're going to uh, we're going to pay a couple more bills here. Uh, let me get this figured out here. Yeah, we'll pay a couple more bills here and I'll make sure everything's back up and running. And we will be back uh, right after this to talk about uh, conservation grants. And no, we didn't lose anybody. Conservation grants in the tech committee. Get the best patterns back by tournament data. Start by finding the best 10% of your lake. Know exactly what to look for and what to throw. After that, you just put them in the boat. Try the deep dive app today. Look at that beast right there. My Pro Guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days. Always plenty of juice, never fail. The best part about Pro Guide batteries, it's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. I'm the kind of guy that never leaves a house without a pocket knife, and Gamagatsu's come out with the EDC series of knives. EDC stands for everyday carry, so whether you're on the water or off, you can always have it with you. The best thing about it to me is that assisted open feature. With this D2 blade, you've got it right here at your fingertips. So if you can't find your scissors, you need to cut a knot, you need to cut your braid, you've always got it. 
Make sure you check it out. Never leave home without your Gamagatsu EDC knife. Born in Japan, using technology, innovation, and precision, Sunline produces the widest selection of fishing lines at the most technologically advanced line factory in the world. Manufactured at the strictest tolerances to produce victories at the highest levels of tournament bass fishing, from household names like Christie, Swindle, and Cruz, to young guns like Cook, Logan, New, and Welcher, they all trust Sunline to take them to the top of the leaderboard. Choose the line that will give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Sunline. All right, welcome back. BTL on a Tuesday talking with Gene Gillen. Uh, let's talk an opportunity, multiple opportunities, three different opportunities, actually, uh, to maybe put a little bit into practice some of the stuff that uh, you've been preaching and then uh, also uh, some scholarship and some grant money. Let's start with the uh, 2024 AFCO, uh, big supporter of btl since they got into the freshwater market and bass conservation grants this is uh this is like not the first year that afco has partnered with this i know that they do the 10 percent pledge uh that both uh bill and casey kind of put their money where their mouth is when it comes to uh supporting conservation in both fresh and salt water uh, we've had the afco live release boats they've done the afco bank bags uh where they've partnered with uh, Bass Nation teams to do cleanups. Mm -hmm. uh, they are a massive proponent of uh, of conservation and taking care of fisheries. So talk a little bit about the AFCO and Bass Conservation Grants. I'll pull the page up right here. AFCO is one of the very few companies in the fishing industry that has conservation, as I, as I call it, as part of their DNA. It is a very, very important part of who they are. And I was on some committees with the American Sport Fishing Association with Bill Shedd, mm -hmm. who uh, was the president of AFCO. I guess he's the CEO now, or I'm not sure what his title is. Uh, Casey's now the president. But Bill came to me when they, when they started to jump into the freshwater market and, and wanted to get involved with BASS on some conservation grant programs. Um, they had already built a live release boat. Uh, they had some publications out, but they wanted to do something to help uh, the Bass Nation chapters around the country with some funding to do conservation projects. So we developed this grant program and we're going on uh, maybe eight years now that we've done this. Uh, so I, I don't remember exactly when we started, but um, you know, part of that 10% pledge that, that AFCO has of putting money back into conservation. In this case, the, the grants are open to any Bass Nation affiliated state chapter or Bass Club that's, that's part of their state Bass Nation. And they can be for habitat enhancement projects. They can be for fish care equipment. Uh, we've they can be for access improvements, uh, invasive species control. There's a whole list of things that they can utilize that money for. The grants are up to $5,000 oh, wow. per, per grant. And it's a fairly simple application. The, the uh, application form is online. And it's a kind of a fill-in-the-blank thing. You send in a proposal. We collect all the proposals at the end of the, uh, the, the open period and we look over them and try to uh, determine which ones we think are the, the most worthy. And we'll typically give out about five or six grants every year. Uh, folks from AFCO and, and I uh, review all the proposals. We've, We've funded uh, a lot of habitat enhancement projects, whether it's aquatic vegetation planting or putting out, uh, you know, plastic uh, fish attractors. Mm -hmm. We've helped groups build live release boats and live release trailers. Just a whole world of things that, that the money can be used for. And, uh, you know, it puts, puts money in the hands of a lot of these smaller organizations that may not have a lot of funding sources. And it's, it's really been a great, a great partnership with AFCO for, 
for all these several years now. Yeah, since uh, 2018, over $120,000 yeah. uh, in grants. Last year, there were five grants all the way from uh, Lake Improvement, Release Trailers, Planting of Cypress Trees, uh, Kentucky Barkley, uh, Live Release Boat up in New York, uh, Stocking Program on the Upper Bay in Maryland. So uh, I'll put the link in the description of the show after this. Uh, yep. If you're a Bass Nation member, you have a project. Uh, very worthwhile and you know you can actually see the tangible results of it which is cool i see the press releases yeah. and stuff that you i'm assuming you write those that goes out where you see hey here's the fish habitat here's right. the live release boat that we're changing so uh that's open to to uh to any bass nation club uh, or, or state chapter or state chapter yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of the ones that we've had I'll, I'll mention this matt the high school fishing teams are are eligible too and a lot of times uh, yeah, sometimes it's easier to get a whole bunch of kids out there to do yeah. the work than it is some of the adults club members, but, uh, the youth directors, uh, a lot of times will mobilize their kids to get them out on these projects. All right, let's move over to the bass fishing hall of fame. Uh, we had Mark Zona on, I think it was last week, or a couple weeks ago, uh, after it was announced that he was one of the five that'll be part of the 2024 class, uh, along with, he was pretty pump that fred arbor gas was in he's like dad's a cool dude and also uh mcginnis ski reese and uh alfred williams uh legendary angler they're one of the first kind of hollow body mm -hmm. frog uh fishermen in there but one of the big uh focuses of the bass fishing hall of fame are scholarships and grants uh and there's a lot that have been taken advantage of there but there's also a lot of meat on the table there specifically for uh, younger people that are yep. looking to get into it. Talk a little bit about the scholarships uh, first. I know this is something that is near well, and, let, and dear to your let heart. Me, let me go back. Let's let's do the, let me talk about the grants first. Okay, because, grants first then. Because the grant program is, the application form is exactly the same as the one for the Bass Nation. It's, we basically just changed the name on the top of the, of the, of the web page. Okay. So we've had a number of Bass Nation clubs that have applied for both and gotten both. So they've gotten, some of them have gotten $10,000 for their projects. Now the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame uh, conservation grants, we have $40,000 in the pot this year to give out to any organization that is doing work that will benefit bass fishing. That's bass clubs. It can be lake associations. It can be state agencies. We gave a grant last year to the Michigan DNR for a smallmouth bass tracking study. So it's not limited to Bass Nation. It is any organization. Last uh, two years ago, we had, I think, four bass clubs that are affiliated with uh, TBF, the Bass Federation, mm -hmm. that won grants. So it's... It's broad spectrum. It's the same kind of things, whether it's fish care or habitat or, you know, any of those, those, uh, categories, uh, $5,000 pop. And we've got 40 grand to give away this year. So, wow. And, and if, Sweet. if that happened to be a, uh, Bass Nation chapter as well, they can apply for both. Okay. And basically just cut and paste their their application information from one grant process to the other and now I showed it on the screen there it's due uh march 30 march 31st right. for both of them that's that's a key we're coming up to the end of the month uh it is a competitive thing and you know we we i suspect we'll probably have 25 or 30 applicants and and have have to try to weed through that and come up with you know eight <laughs> or ten really good projects um, and if people don't get it one year, they can apply the next year. Okay. You know, so it, it, uh, it's, it's a really great way to get some money in the hands of people doing some good stuff for conservation. So the scholarship at the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame is something that we started just a couple of years ago that really spun off of a scholarship program that Shimano had started with BASS several years ago. And the idea was to encourage students who want to become practicing biologists. 
to help them with some funding in their uh, for their college. A lot of the state agencies these days are having a hard time finding qualified students coming out of college that know the biology, but are also anglers. Mm -hmm. And that's a big key is you got kids coming out of school that know the science, but they're not fishermen and they don't understand the mentality of the angler or, or who are going to be their customers. If you want to look at it that way. So this scholarship is to encourage and reward those students who are both anglers and want to become practicing fish biologists, whether it's at a state or a federal agency or something like that. Um, we're, we're pretty specific on that. If they want to become a college professor, that we don't consider them. If they want to go off into some sort of laboratory research, we don't consider them. We're looking at people that, that are fishermen that want to become the next generation of fish managers that are managing our bass fisheries across the country. And we have $25,000 in that pot uh, to give away. Okay. And uh, the application deadline for that, I believe, is April 15th. Correct. So <clears throat> we'll be awarding those grants sometime this summer. After, and last year, we got about 30 applicants for that, too. Bassfishinghof.com. It's literally the first thing that pops up under the Fishery Management Scholarship Program. And it's, it's hof.com slash scholarship. And historically, that scholarship program, there are quite a few of the people that have gotten that scholarship that are now, in fact, biologists working for state agencies. Oh, that's cool. So it's doing what we want it to do. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Scholarship? Grant stuff related that's just you got to get off your chest here, Gene, before uh, we move on to the spicy before section we, before of BTO. We get into the, the, the controversy, I, I will I will make a, a note that next week at the Bassmaster Classic, next weekend, uh, weekend after next, I guess, actually, uh, we're hosting our Bass Conservation Summit, which we do this every two years at the Classic. We bring the Bass Nation state conservation directors from as many of them will come this year. We've got about 30 of them and we invite the state fisheries chief from all the state fish and wildlife agencies. Now, some of the chiefs come, sometimes they will send like their bass biologist mm -hmm. in their place. <clears throat> this year we're going to have almost a hundred people. Wow. Congratulations. Um, that's good, right? It's great. It's killing my budget because <laughs> we we uh, we we put them up in a hotel and we feed them and all they got to do basically is get there. Yeah. Um, but it's a great opportunity for the fishing organizations, the state chapters, to to learn from the biologists and vice versa for the biologists to learn from the state uh, bass nation conservation guys. And we talk about uh, our agenda this year has got all kinds of cool stuff on it for uh, talking about bass management. And, and, and you know, we, we've got lots of time for discussions about controversial issues. Uh, it's not a public thing. This is, you know, an invitation deal. But it's something that we've done now for, for many years. And it's a... Uh, it's really helped create some good relationships between the Bass Nation guys and their state fish and wildlife people. A foot in the door is huge when exactly. you have someone to call just to know what's going on, to find out about a meeting right. that you might want to attend about your fishery, to have have a line of communication. Right. Uh, one thing I always tell my my conservation directors around the country is they need to know, they, they need to be on a first name basis with their state fish chief. So that when they call that fish chief, he picks up a phone and they can talk. And this summit that we do every two years really helps build those kind of relationships. 
Uh, real quick on the scholarships, Nick's one, Nick wants to know, is that U.S. only or can, can, can Canadians apply? Canadians can apply for the scholarships, yes. We, mm -hmm. gave, we awarded one to a young lady in uh, New Brunswick, I think, last year. And you pay year. them in loonies and toonies. Pardon me? You pay them in loonies and toonies? <sighs> yeah, whatever. <clears throat> that's, 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 that's Barbara <laughs> Bowman's challenge is how, how she's going to write the check. <laughs> I hear you. All right. Uh, so over a hundred, will there be like anything that comes out of that or that's kind of all just a behind the scenes thing? The that, summit? Yeah. Um, eventually we're, we're working right now on trying to get all of the presentations recorded. Okay. And we will post them on Bassmaster.com uh, at some point after the meeting. There you go. All right. I did not know this. I, I knew that there was a committee. I didn't know what it was called. It is, uh, we're switching gears here to tournament fishing. We're 56 minutes in. You guys wanted it. You got it. We're going to talk about it. I'll, I'm interested in it now. Uh, <clears throat> you are on the, is it called the Bassmaster Tech Committee? Mm -hmm. Explain what it is <clears throat> and why it exists and any other pertinent information about this tech committee okay <clears throat> following the last couple of elite tournaments last year i mean who's who's not aware of the the issues that blew up in bass fishing re related to ford vesting sonar uh <clears throat> our tournament managers our administration at bass uh got a lot of feedback from anglers from the public about <clears throat> where where this is all going and there was a clamor to to ban forward facing sonar there was a lot of pros and cons and chase anderson our our ceo said we need to look into this and not make a a, a quick decision until we have a sufficient information to really know how this affects all the players. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> rather than jump right out with for 2024 and say, here, here's what we're going to do in terms of banning or regulating or restricting or whatever, uh, or not doing anything, uh, Chase said, let's form a committee and we're going to spend the year looking into all of aspects of how technology is impacting the sport, mm -hmm. not just forward facing sonar. So we're, we're kind of, that's why it's called the tech committee is we're, we're trying to, to broaden that out a little bit and, and look at technology on, on a little broader scale, obviously forward facing sonar is, or, or <laughs> anymore, I think we're going to have to start calling it live sonar because some of the transducers point backwards right, yeah, yeah. or to the side rather than forwards. But anyway, uh, we're, we're going to look at, at more than just the sonar issues. There's, there's other things, the crappie breaks, um, the, you know, our, we saw some of those power pop up breaks. at Lake Fork. The power breaks. Power breaks. Excuse me. Um, there are, I've got them on my boat right out there. If you want yeah. to take a gander at them after. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm I've, pretty I've, passionate about that topic. I've <laughs> talked to several tournament directors at length about it. Yeah. So anyway, we're, that's, that's the whole, that was the genesis of the tech committee. And there are <clears throat> people on the committee, uh, at Bass that are, uh, we've got people from the tournament staff. We've got people from the, uh, the media side, We've got folks from the, uh, the, the video production side. Uh, I represent the conservation side of okay. the question. <clears throat> my, my role on the committee is to interact with the state fish and wildlife agencies to see where they are falling on this issue and, and what they're going to be doing and how that might impact fishery management and, and the health and longevity of our fisheries and then take that information back to the tech committee as as one of the pieces of the puzzle that the committee will be 
looking to try to fit together um, to see if there's something that needs to be done one way or another. Okay. So again, there's, there's all these different aspects that we're having to look at. It's not, it's not just the product that Bass puts out on live, whether when we're live streaming or on FS1. It's not just the conservation aspects, although that's certainly going to be a big, a big component of it. Um, <clears throat> we've got people on the committee that represent the anglers, uh, interface with the angler and talking to, to the anglers mm -hmm. and, and <clears throat> obviously our tournament directors interact with, with the anglers at, at the open and, and elite levels. <clears throat> so it's a lot of different moving parts right now. Mm -hmm. And so what we did, <clears throat> what we've done so far for the most part, we've had a number of different calls. Anytime something comes up where one of us finds some information, we share it with the committee at the pre tournament meeting, uh, at Toledo bend before the first elite tournament, we did a survey. Uh, where we physically, each one of the boats as they came through the the line, because they that's that's the meeting where the anglers go through and they check their wraps and their they take pictures of their boats and it's it's kind of that pre tournament check. As they came through the line, <clears throat> we counted the number and got the models of the various sonar units they have on their boats how many transducers, what kind they were, where they were mounted, how many batteries they had, what kind of batteries. We actually measured how high the sonar units came up off the front deck from a visibility standpoint. We did the same kind of measurement back at the, at the driver's seat <clears throat> from the, the driver's seat to the top of the units on the console to see how high they were because uh, there's been some concerns about <clears throat> visibility mm -hmm. and, and if, is that a safety issue uh, with, with more and more people stacking more and more units uh, in front of them, is that becoming a potential safety problem? So we did that whole, <clears throat> that whole survey of all the anglers and, uh, and now what we're doing is, after each elite series event, we've got people that are interviewing the top 10 anglers and asking them a series of questions about, uh, how the, how the technology impacted their fishing for that, mm -hmm. that tournament, um, percentage of use, that sort of thing. So that's where we are right now. I'm going to leave it at that because I want to have an objective discussion about this. I just wanted people to know <laughs> what Bass is doing as far as monitoring it and what's on the radar. I have absolutely zero desire to go down the subjective route on this. Uh, you don't have to search very far on the internet to find a lot of opinions on it, but from an objective <laughs> viewpoint as a member of the tech committee, that is what, bass is doing right, right now and in 2024 and chase anderson has been adamant about the idea we are not going to change anything this year mm -hmm. we're the the rules that were put in place at the beginning of the season for what equipment was allowed or not allowed will remain the same throughout this season mm-hmm Sometime later this year, this committee will make recommendations and ultimately Chase will be the ones that will be the one making, making a call as to what Bass will do, but probably sometime late this year, uh, Bass will make some sort of announcement to the anglers about what we project the rules are going to be for 2025 to give them plenty of time to to get their boats and their equipment. And you know, it, we, we don't want to spring this. Whether on they want to add three more graphs and three more transducers or, or whether they have to limit what they right, had in 2024 right. to be compliant. Which, whichever way that, whatever way that goes, we're not going to change it in 24. 
but give them time uh, prior to the 25 season to adjust whichever way might be necessary, if anything is necessary. Well, that's a good that time point. to have a podcast like this year with everything. So that's that'll issues. be coming on, yeah, whenever, sometime <laughs> later this year. There's a lot of people who said a lot of things about this. It's it's not an a, a enviable job to be making these decisions because, like you said before you went live, there is a zero percent chance of making everybody happy. Right. And then you know the the perception is you know Bass is a for profit organization that runs a lot of technology, a, a lot of ads for companies that make a lot of this stuff in it. So you've got one whole side, like a, 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 as far as being objective without saying, oh, well, the only reason Bass is allowing this is because they're getting yeah. paid by X company that makes this and that. And as long as they're paying them, it'll never go away. It, I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard that at Bass, sure. but sure. there's also has to be an element of, purity in it to where you guys are not just looking at a contract for a year in advance. You're looking at the next 50 years of the sport. That's relatively new where we're going to go to the classic and see the guys who won the first couple of Bassmaster classics that are still walking around. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting element that I know a lot of people are convinced nothing will happen as long as electronics companies are sponsoring any organization within that within bass. MLF, MPFL, any of those. Well, I, I will tell you from our perspective that Chase has said that m my role as the conservation mm -hmm. side of this thing is to listen to what the state agencies are saying. And if at some point the states say that there is concern, that there needs to be some sort of limitations, the first and foremost that's going to be on the states to en enact some sort of rule limitations so that it's fair across all anglers mm -hmm. rather than targeting tournament anglers you want if, if the state's going to make a a rule about how many fish you can keep or how big they have to be or what equipment you can and can't use it needs to be fair so that it applies across the board mm -hmm. You don't want to target one specific group. Right now, we haven't heard anything out of anybody that I'm aware of other than the state of Wisconsin floated a question Saw that. about a week ago. Uh, they, they do a thing every spring where they throw out a whole list of potential, uh, their proposals, where they just want to kind of get public feedback on them. And one of them was should forward facing sonar and 360 technology be banned. Mm -hmm. And they, they will have public meetings in April, all in every County in Wisconsin where people can come and uh, voice their opinions about this whole list of potential proposals that are about fishing and hunting and all sorts of things. That's where people need to show up. We need to get anglers in Wisconsin to show up at those meetings and voice their opinions one way or another about what they think needs to happen. That's fair. Um, again, if, if you don't, or if only people from one side of the argument show up, you may or may not like the results. Mm -hmm. Now in Wisconsin, this doesn't automatically make it a law. There's still a process they have to go through before that opinion can actually become a state fishing regulation. Mm -hmm. It's a couple of year process. So this is not something that's happening overnight, but right now there are uh, about a half a dozen states that are doing some survey work, looking into how many anglers are using the technology, whether they're catching more, whether they're keeping more there. It, it's still very early in that process on, uh, at least from the conservation side. Uh, one of the things that it's, it's on my agenda for the conservation summit at the classic in two weeks. Uh, we've got several, a couple of States that are in the process of doing those kind of surveys that are going to be presenting some information on just what they're finding so far, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's far, far from 
any kind of conclusions. You can't just do like one thing. You're, you're years and years and years to right. see the impacts of this right. stuff. That's what some, it, yeah. yeah. I mean, that would also explain why Randy just bought a vacation home in the Dells. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like I said, I want to try to keep this as objective as possible. Steve, yeah. Steve did post this and this, I would like to rebut this. He said the pros are snagging bass and weighing them off forward facing sonar. That is illegal. It, right. You can weigh in a fish unless there is a state that says it is hooked. You cannot have a fish that is hooked outside the mouth. You Correct. can weigh in a fish that is hooked outside of the mouth. That is 100% legal. It is not legal to intentionally hook a fish outside of the mouth in any state or form, whether you can see that fish or not. Right. So snagging a fish off of forward facing sonar, illegal. We know about it in the opens. Hank has made a point about it in the opens. They know about it on the Elite Series. It's been made a point on the Elite Series. Right. You cannot snag a fish off of forward-facing sonar intentionally. Now, you can be fishing for a fish off forward-facing sonar with like a jerk bait, and the fish eats it, and he has a treble hook outside the mouth or something like that. As long as a state agency, that's a legal fish. But intentionally going in and saying, hey, I'm going to bring my lure past this thing that I'm seeing on my forward-facing sonar, and I'm going to intentionally snag it, illegal everyone knows it is if that's happening then that is breaking the rules but to say that this is yeah. happening yeah. on it is total bs show me the proof for that's happening at least that's with bass i don't know what right. it is over on the mlf side but i've heard a couple of people say it i haven't said anything about it on the show but 110 percent, this has been dealt with this is not a legal activity and i don't think that it's happening I, I fully agree with you. It's it's uh, the way our rule is written. It it goes to intent. We're not intentionally trying to to snag or foul hook fish. But like you said, there are some states that, depending on how their rules are written, the fish has to be hooked inside the mouth, uh, and and those fish have to be released. Now that's that's up to you know the states to enforce those regulations how they how they want to interpret and enforce those regulations. But ours our rule has always gone to intent. Um, obviously bed fishing where you're sight fishing, you're looking at the fish, you know, the fish has to be hooked in the mouth. That's in our rules as well. But, uh, it, it's, th there are, there are so many myths, misconceptions, misinformation out there about the whole, uh, forward facing sonar issue, uh, that, and social media has has really clouded the issues so freaking much disaster Gene. because there's there's just so much that people comment on without really knowing the facts and it's it's unfortunate that it has created such a division among anglers that uh, I haven't seen anything like this in God I'm old 50 years. Uh, I've never seen anything that, that I can recall that was this controversial. Um, but I think a lot of that's because social media has just allowed this to blow up. And everybody that's got a keyboard or a cell phone can comment on something without really knowing all the facts. And that's unfortunate that it's gone that direction. You guys should be like, is that called sequestered like a jury? <laughs> when it's like a when it's like a court TV case where you guys aren't allowed to look at any uh, anything that's going on until it's done. You guys should be all you guys should all have to live like on an island for the next eight months <laughs> with no cell phones. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but listen, uh, you can't. It's hard to do this without. I want I just I'm I'm kind of over it now. I just wanted an objective yep. take on what Bass is doing. I don't think it's been out there to where they say, hey, this is what's happening. This is what we're doing. This is what we're taking into account. I think. Right. that's a package and you know we'll throw there's three organizations there's mlf there's and with high mpfl and there's bass it, what bass is doing is 100 percent independent from what mlf is doing which is 100 percent independent from what the mpfl is doing me personally i think within two years you're going to see three drastic 
changes or not changes, but three different variations from all three organizations, all of which are for profit organizations where they're going to maneuver to try to do what they feel is best for their organization for the future of tournament fishing. It wouldn't surprise me if you have one that's no holes barred freaking make the thing look like a spaceship one that's no forward facing sonar and one that's a reasonable mm -hmm. compromise for all parties involved you guys can deduct on who does what on that but any way else you want to put a bow on this well uh, we're not just looking out for bass the organization part of what our goal uh, and and chase has said this is that we want to look at the future of obviously the company but the sport of tournament fishing and the sport of bass fishing on on a broader sense so there's there's a lot more moving parts to it than just what happens on the elite series or the opens or what is seen on uh our, our live stream or on FS1. So we, we've got to look long-term and big picture with this whole thing. And that's why we've Chase has said, let's take a year and mm -hmm. let's look at it objectively and try to look at all the different aspects of this <laughs> and not make any decisions and not make any changes until we have uh, a better ground. Poor Chase. It. Dude comes into this thing running it in what 2018. I mean, he knows about it and everything, but he's got to deal with the split. He he freaking gets his way through that, and he's like, "All right, we're good to go." Then this stuff comes along. So you start hearing about it. The guy's just just needs a couple years of a yep. smooth sailing. Yeah, but he's he's done a great job, and and yeah. and Chase is very thoughtful. He he really thinks through these issues. And, and he's very open-minded and, and thinks not just, he doesn't have that tunnel vision. He's thinking about all the different aspects that might play into this. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's a really good way to look at it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we got through that one fairly unscathed. It's hard not to talk about it just because it's professional bass fishing right now. And I do a show four times a week, five times a week that covers professional bass fishing. Yeah. Like, w what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's certainly the, the, the topic of conversation around the, <clears throat> around the uh, weigh-ins and at the pool hall and at the tackle shop and everywhere else. But uh, we'll see. Uh, I think, I think the jury's just way too far from out. We, we, we just don't have enough information yet on how this is going to all play out. Okay. What year is it where it's no longer an issue? Here, nowhere indifferent where it's, you know, the Alabama rig, there was Alabama rig fatigue. You had guys who were pissed that it wasn't, mm -hmm. you couldn't use it. You had guys who thought it was the right thing. That stuff kind of died off. I would say after literally like a two years, a year and a half, two I, years, I think, how long before all this dies out? And it's just, I think that's, I think that that's going to be probably the same, the same timeline. I would think that within a, within a couple of years, we'll, we'll have most of this kind of stuff figured out from, from the biological side and from the, the social side and the economic side, you know, give us a couple of years. I think it'll, it'll all kind of straighten itself out and, and hopefully, um, things won't be the, the, the industry won't have torn itself apart by then. <laughs> all right, Gene, this was a good show, man. I, uh, I learned a lot in the first part of the show and in the, and in the second half of the show, everyone says they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hear it. The comment section just lights up as soon as it starts <laughs> going. But I mean, that's also why you got guys that are getting tons of views on it. Guys who are doing two, three videos a day about it. You have, uh, you have it on all ends of the spectrum yeah. and all ends in between. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's wild, man. Yeah. I just want to go fishing. You know, that's... When are you going to get to go fishing next? Oh, I wish we went yesterday. 
Uh, it was a little slow, but uh, I don't think I caught a five pounder yesterday, which is really unusual for my little lake. <clears throat> but uh, it was my wife's birthday, and she decided she wanted to go fishing. Oh, well, happy birthday! And so uh, she she was hoping for a ten pounder, but it it just didn't quite materialize that Didn't you way. say she just broke her PB this year already? She did. She did. Uh, about a month and a half ago, she caught a 8.44, and uh, that's her, her best fish. Are you allowed to say what she caught it on? Uh, she caught it on a white chatterbait. Did it smoke it? Yeah. In like, fact, uh, one, of the, one of the other, it, it's a, a little club lake. Yes, it's a private lake. Yes, it's got a bunch of big bass in it, and I'm proud of it. Um, one of the other members pulled up to just say hi and, and Pat turned around and said, well, you guys go catch a big one. And about the time this thing just, Oh, so she had an audience too. freight train her chatterbait. And, uh, yeah, so she, <laughs> she got it in the boat and got to show it off. So, uh, that's cool. Yeah, it was good. It's, uh, it's been a good spring. No, uh, I, I haven't. I haven't had a dirty 30 yet, which I'm a little behind schedule there. Normally I'll have a 30 pound bag sometime in early March, but, uh, the weather's been just kind of goofy. And then dang gum, I'm working. I, I got stuff that I'm, I've been on two tournaments through two elite tournaments and we got the classic coming up. Yeah. And, uh, boy, we get into April, which is really prime season. I got, I got stuff meetings and stuff that i go to in addition to elite tournaments uh i i got somewhere to go every week in april look at my april this yeah. is the first time in history yeah wow yeah is that not wild yeah it's bizarre well, mine's just the opposite mine's completely filled up and uh that's eating into my fishing that's for sure but uh we'll we'll sneak out a few days here and there it's uh it's a nice thing about uh, I took my boat in uh, yesterday or, yeah, a couple of days ago. You still, you still have like a vintage champion in 19, mint condition, right? 1996 champion with a 200 EFI Mercury on it that uh, I, I took it in to have some service work done on it, try to get it all tuned up and make sure everything's working good. I spent on most of my time now in my John boat. I've got a kind of a tricked out John boat that we take to our little private lake. And, uh, but the big, the big boat, you know, we get out on the bigger lakes and obviously when we go to, I'll, I'll take it to St. Clair. We go to up there every spring in, uh, in May chasing smallmouth. And then I'll go to Minnesota a couple of times. I'm kind of a smallmouth junkie. And, I've done it with you. I fished up there yep, with you. Yeah. Remember we were trying to figure out how to use that dang fly that fighter was <laughs> catching them on. And we were like, I think it's, <laughs> we're like, yep, that's how you do it. Yeah. Like literally, like yeah. we both had a couple. Neither of us had ever caught one on it because we're in Oklahoma. Yeah, and we were just like, you're just. I think you just like slowly re and literally like second cast line just starts singing out the <laughs> other way. That was so much fun. Yeah, it's. It, I I really enjoy going up there. I've got a uh, my buddy Hal Schram, uh, professor retired professor has a cabin in Minnesota, and I'll go up and spend a week or two with him. And uh, we'll, we'll go to Mille Lacs and we'll fish the Mississippi River. And there's gosh, so many other cool little lakes up there that have smallmouth in them. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing that. And uh, um, I, I I tell people that I'm I'm kind of on a glide path now. I've been doing this job with bass now for ten years. You know, mm -hmm. thir thirty years with the state, and now ten years with bass. And I'm kind of getting to the point where I want to fish more. And so I'm, I'm kind of thinking, how, how much longer am I going to be doing this? Bass, you how much longer you game. want. You're in the Hall of Fame, Pete. But, uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's nice. And, and Chase gives me the flexibility to, you know, if I'm, if I'm working on stuff, I'm working on stuff. But the time in between, I can go fishing. And so it's a pretty good gig. <laughs> I like it. Let's end it on a positive note. I thought the other one was negative. And they're still going at it in the chat, <laughs> but uh, I'm all about that. I'm actually get to go fishing tomorrow to uh, Kyle Patrick, who's in the classic won the uh, mm -hmm. open last year on Lake of the Ozarks yeah, is, is flying into Oklahoma city. He's good buddies oh, with cool. uh, Austin Cranford. Yeah. And so uh, Kyle's going to be in studio tomorrow for BTL. 
kind of an announcement on that. And then a uh, former Elite Series pro, you know him well, uh, Kevin Ledoux, mm-hmm. got the morning off work. So Austin and Kyle and me and Kevin uh, are going to go out to a lake and have a little one-on-one. There you go. For some bragging rights and I, possibly I got, to, I got to know Kyle at the NPAA Yeah, he did. He conference. went there. Yeah, that, he was one uh, of the guys who actually took up some of the right. veterans' suggestions of yep. attending that to make contacts and figure yep. out what's going on in the industry. Yep. So in bright, fact, bright guy. He's been he's on the board now for NPAA. Oh, cool. So uh, is Cruz still heavily involved in that? Uh, some, some, some. Ike. Yeah. Yep. No, Ike. He's yeah. Remember? Yeah. There's and, several. There's several of the elite guys that are part of NPAA and you know, that, that organization kind of on a, on a positive is um, a lot of people think of it kind of like a union or something like that. It's really not. It's, it's an advocacy organization. It's a group that, that I think can really help provide a good voice for, for anglers, especially guys that are pro anglers or guides, anybody that's in the fishing profession. And it's a really good organization, I think, that can kind of help unify that voice where we need it when it comes to a lot of this political advocacy. So, uh, but yeah, anyway, Kyle is, uh, was involved in that. And so, good deal. We need to end it there. before I get fired up again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dude, that was awesome. Like I said, a, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I've, spent, uh, I've spent time on the water with you in the boat. We uh, can do it again. Fishing. Yeah, we do. We need to go fishing again. Uh, you know, a lot of time off the water, time fun fishing. Uh, greatly appreciate uh, your knowledge and what you brought to the sport. Uh, couldn't have been happier that you're actually been, you know, acknowledged for it and other people appreciate what it is because there's a lot of thankless work behind the scenes, especially in the uh, conservation. But uh, bass fishing hall of fame member, you can go to the bass fishing hall of fame there at Wonders of Wildlife and see. Uh, see gene gilliland right there right next to uh the ray scotts the kevin van dams and all that and what you've contributed to the sport so uh i take it for granted that i came to oklahoma and got involved in this and have just kind of known you for the past 15 years especially through mark you and mark go way back you're part of the original smith optics team bz (laughs) with the yellow jerseys and the rock music and that back in the day and then i i kind of inherited you uh after Uh that and like i said i take i take uh I take for granted uh, your expertise and knowledge, not only what you did for so many years in Oklahoma, uh, but then what you've done uh, over the past, like I said, decade with uh, with Bass as the National Conservation Director. I don't think people realize how many tournaments you're at behind the scenes, uh, working with the live release boat, regulating the water, talking with the guys, how much uh, Bass and people in the industry go to you for uh, questions that there's probably less than 10 people in the world that know the answer to, and then how you use your contacts uh, around the country, both politically and within the industry, uh, to better the sport of bass fishing, tournament bass fishing, and bass master. So thank you very much, thank Mr. Goland. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Matt. Um, anytime, I'd be glad to come back and we need to do a, a whole Q&A thing sometime. Oh, that would just get Western. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, do me a favor, hit the like button on this, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't already, if you're listening on iTunes, uh, leave a review, five-star review tomorrow, Kyle Patrick in studio. And then on Thursday, Uncle Frank is back and we have a special guest on Thursday. We have the guys from Great Lakes Finesse that are also going to jump on along with the schedule for the upcoming Bassmaster Classic. Uh I got to shoot some day fives. We have a couple day fives, the new guide day episodes coming up. So uh, those will be returning to BassOwn.com on every Friday at 8.30 a.m. So that's all we got for today. We'll talk to everybody then. See ya.